This should be a pretty quick video on the very last item in this section, the invertible matrix theorem. The invertible matrix theorem has one condition, and that is that A is a square matrix. So we have an, uh, a matrix A, and it's a square matrix, and its dimensions are n by n, which means it could be 2 by 2 or 12 by 12, as long as the two values here are the same which is kind of a redundant way of saying it's square. Once we know that, then the theorem goes on to say that if this is true, then the following statements are equivalent, and there are seven statements. We're going to go e over each of those statements one at a time. It won't take very long, but there's one very important thing that I want to start with, and that is this. This here is not an if statement followed by then statements. In other words, oftentimes a theorem will say, uh, suppose such and such is true, then this is also true. If this statement is true, then this statement is true. That is not what's happening here. What's happening here is that we're starting with an n by n square matrix, and if we have one of those, then we can say that each of the following seven statements are equivalent. What that means is that given a square matrix, if statement four is true, then statement one is also true. If statement two is true, then statement 7 is also true. In fact, if statement 4 is true, then statements 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, and 7 are also true. They're equivalent. Once you know one of them, you know the others are also true. The difference is that we're not starting with an if statement up here. If this condition is met, then these conditions are met. That is not what's happening. If this condition is met, then one of these conditions must also be met. And if it is, all the others are also met. It's a very subtle difference, but it's very important. So let's go over what those seven conditions are, or what those seven, um, seven statements are. Okay, so the first statement here is A is invertible. So what we have is A is an n by n square matrix. And if A is invertible, all of these are also true. We don't know what they are yet, but we'll get to those in a minute. So this is kind of a part of an if statement, but really it's, it's more just a, a condition that has to be met before we can really talk about the others. Assuming that this part is true, then as long as one of these is true, the others are also true. And the first of these statements is that A is invertible. That means that if we have a square matrix A, A is an n by n square matrix, and A is invertible, then we can also make these other claims down here as well. So we need this to be true, and we need this to be true before we can say these other ones are true. The second statement is A is row equivalent to the n by n identity matrix I sub n. Now, if A is a square matrix and A is invertible, in other words, A has an inverse, then we automatically know that I can reduce A to the identity matrix I sub n. If I take A, an n by n square matrix, and I find that I can reduce it to the identity matrix, then I know it will have an inverse. In other words, if we're working with a square matrix and this statement is true, then this statement is also true. So one of these has to be true before I can assume the other. Now the third statement is that n has, uh, A has n pivot positions. So if that happens to be easier to check for, A has n pivot positions, then as long as A is an n by n square matrix, it turns out that it has n pivot positions, and I can automatically assume it can be reduced to the identity matrix. That means if I can count n pivot positions, I can automatically assume that, for example, e, F, G, H, I, it's very messy, can be row reduced to this matrix. Okay? But I have to know that first A is an n by n square matrix, and then that also that it has n pivot positions, or that I know somehow that it has an inverse. Then I can reduce it. In fact, th by this theorem, what I'm saying is that if I know it has n pivot positions, I don't need to do the work here. I can assume that it can be reduced to this, this uh, identity matrix. If I know one of these statements, I also know all the others are true. Okay, our next statement is that the equation uh, the matrix equation, Ax equals 0, has only the trivial solution, x equals 0. Remember that this is a uh, column matrix, or sometimes we call it a vector. We'll be getting into that pretty soon here. 
um, which means that this is also a column matrix, which means we can also call that a vector. Um, that also means that our, this is our B, right? This is the matrix equation A, X equals B, and it just happens that B equals zero, but B is also a column matrix. So we're gonna, we're gonna label those that way. That's some notation that I've used a little bit before, but um, we'll be using it more in the future, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce it again here. So, so far what we have is, say for example, uh, I can tell very easily that A has to, uh, N pivot positions. I can go straight to the fact that I know the only solution to this equation is the trivial solution. I don't have to do any work. I have to do work to, to show that one of these conditions is met, but once one of the conditions is met, all the other ones are as well. That's one of the things that makes this, uh, this theorem so powerful. All right, let's take a look at the next one. The next two actually go together, but I'll list them one at a time and then we'll talk about them together. A matrix C exists such that the matrix C times the matrix A in that order equals the identity matrix, right? So C happens to be the inverse of A, which we've already established A has an inverse. That means a matrix C exists that is the inverse of A, so that when you multiply them together, multiply A by C from the left, you get the identity matrix. And number six says that a matrix D exists such that when you multiply A and D together, you get the identity matrix. But here we're multiplying D, multiplying A by D with D on the right. Here we're multiplying A by C, but with C on the left, right? So we're, it, this theorem is, is making the point of saying that we know matrix multiplication is not commutative, but we can find matrices C and D such that no matter which direction you want to multiply A by from the left or from the right, a matrix exists that we, you can do that and end up with the identity matrix. These two statements seem a little bit redundant to me, five and six, um, because we've already established that as long as one of these other statements is true, A has an inverse. Or we might say, Look, let me show you A has an inverse, and I'll do the work to, to, to demonstrate that there is an inverse, there is a matrix that is A's inverse matrix. So however I want to show that A has an inverse, if it has an inverse, then it's called A inverse. And if I multiply A by A inverse, where did my, where did my one go there? Um, if I multiply A by its inverse from the left, I'm going to get the identity matrix. If I multiply A by its inverse, sorry, I said from the left here, A by its inverse from the right. If I multiply A by its inverse from the left, I also get the identity matrix. In fact, at the very beginning of this section, the textbook says, given a square matrix A, the matrix A inverse is called the inverse of matrix A if, and here's the condition, a times A inverse equals A inverse times A, and that equals I. So that's the definition of an inverse. That tells me that if A has an inverse, then these two statements must automatically be true. And in fact, they mean the same thing. So if I say A is invertible, then I can find a matrix C, or we're just gonna call it A inverse. I can find a matrix D that is also A inverse. This sort of implies that they might be different but they can't be if the product is I sub n. Anyway, so these two feel a little bit redundant to me, but they're part of the list, so I'm just gonna go ahead and leave them in there. Okay, our last statement is that the transpose matrix, A transpose, is invertible. In other words, if A, B, C, D has, because this is a two by two matrix, if it has two pivot points, or if it can be reduced to one, zero, zero, one, then I automatically know that A, B, C, D should not have written equals there. They are not equal. But if this matrix has an inverse or has two pivot positions, or uh, where's the other one, is equivalent to uh, one, zero, zero, one, then this matrix also has an inverse. And if this matrix has an inverse, then its transpose has an inverse, and all the other statements are true. So this one's not one that you'll use very often, but it's handy to have kind of in the back pocket. All right, so how might you use this information? Well, let's say, for example, that you're given a matrix equation 
AX equals B. And of course, it would have to be a real equation if you were going to solve it. I'd have to tell you what the matrix A was. I'd have to tell you what the column matrices X and B were. Then, uh, let's see, if A is square, then you could use this to solve this equation by, for example, remember that if this is true, that x is equal to a inverse b. So if you can find a inverse, right, then you automatically know a is invertible. You know from having found that the, the inverse that a has an inverse. And uh, from that, you can assume that this equation only has a trivial solution. So if b happens to be 0, you don't have any more work to do. You can say by the invertible matrix theorem, x equals 0. That assumes, of course, that b is 0. Let me get the right eraser here. If I give you this matrix equation, right? And you are able to find A inverse. You have to find A inverse first. Once you know that A has an inverse, you don't even have to do this. You just have to say, oh, A has an inverse. This equation only has the zero, the, the trivial solution. A has an inverse. This equation only has a trivial solution. There are no other solutions, right? So that's one way in which you might use this information. Of course, there are probably other ways as well, but I think that's probably the best example and uh, possibly the most useful. But that's the invertible matrix theorem. And uh, this video is actually, it's only 12 minutes, but it's already longer than I intended for it to be. This is the last video in this section. And in fact, this is the last video in this chapter and in this module. So if you're taking this course with me and you're watching this video because you're in my uh, linear algebra course. And the next thing we're going to be doing is taking a two-part assessment. So you'll find more details about that in our Canvas shell, but uh, that's the next step. And this is kind of a nice place to end this section. We're going to be doing something uh, called determinants next, but let's finish up our work on systems of equations and matrices with a nice two-part assessment. And I will see you in module two.